Hello all and welcome to Miss Martin's classroom. Today's podcast will be featuring a realistic fiction YA middle grade novel. Beatrice Giovanni is starting her senior year at the top of her class, is basically guaranteed a scholarship to her dream school, and she has an amazing boyfriend. She feels like she finally has high school all figured out. Yet, there seems to be one singular problem. Beatrice and her friends are the targets of bullying. As a social pariah, B decides to use her killer math skills to figure out the formula, which she believes will help her escape the taunts and climb the social ladder, achieving the ultimate happiness in high school at last. With this formula, her friends quickly find themselves in the upper social spheres of the hierarchy, But, B finds herself dumped for the quirky, manic pixie new girl. So, she decides to use the formula on herself, reinventing herself as the eccentric and quirky Trixie, a manic pixie dream girl, to win back Jessie's heart. You're not late, Beatrice, my mom said as she rolled the Prius to a stop in front of Spencer's house at exactly two minutes to eight. I glanced at her out of the corner of my eye. Only because you hit three out of seven green lights, blew through a questionable yellow, and cut off that old lady trying to make a left into her driveway. It had been a miracle of modern commuting that we were on time, and I wanted to make sure she understood that our punctuality was a fluke. My mom was late for pretty much everything except mass and the hair salon, a trait that had driven my dad crazy since before he'd met her. When she was in his legal secretary position, she'd even shown up half an hour late to their final divorce mediation, though I was relatively sure she'd done that on purpose. My mom let out an audible sigh. (sighs) You don't even have class until nine. She was right. The first day was a delayed start, and I was only meeting my friends for bagels and coffee, so it wasn't like I was going to be marked tardy, which would have counted on my permanent record. But that wasn't the point. If I'm not five minutes early, I said matter-of-factly, I'm late. Beatrice, her lilting tag-along accent always made my name sound regal. You need to loosen up. You're a senior now. Have some fun! I grabbed my wheelie bag, mentally ticking off the seconds. This conversation was eating up precious time. I have plenty of fun, Mom. She sighed dramatically. (sighs) Don't call me that, Anak. Whenever my mom renewed her hunt for husband number two, I was no longer allowed to call her mom. Why? Because she thought she could pass as my older sister. Sorry, I said, opening the car door. Who's the new prospect? My mom sighed again, deeper this time. (sighs) Benjamin Fildberger Esquire. So that explained her outfit. I eyed it with a mix of horror, 65%, and awe, 35%. She had chosen a red dress, sleeveless with a draped neckline and a thigh slit that effectively negated the knee-length hem. Don't get me wrong, she looked fabulous. My mom had this sexy panay charm about her that had been completely lost in the genetic translation when it came to me. Probably because, as my mom loved to remind me, I was only half Filipino. Is that work appropriate? I asked. She clucked her tongue. Maybe if you dressed with a little more pizzazz, you might make a few friends at school. She paused. Girlfriends. I smoothed down my navy blazer, piped in white. I have friends. Mm Mm-hmm. Spencer and Gabe might have been nerds and outcasts, but they were my nerds and outcasts, and contrary to my mom's belief, dressing like an extra in a Katy Perry video wasn't going to increase my popularity at school or win me any female friends. I would tried that freshman year after my parents' divorce had pulled the rug out from under me. Quality over quantity, I said, quoting one of my dad's favorite sayings which had a 95% chance of making my mom cringe. Then I slammed the door and dragged my wheelie bag back up to Spencer's garage. I'm here, I announced as I pushed open the side door. 45 seconds early. 
Okay, it was more like 15, but since Spencer was standing at his easel, brush flying across the canvas, I doubt he was paying any close attention. Spencer Proust Cat and I had met in honors English freshman year, and he was the epitome of a brooding, absent-minded artist, which was wholly underappreciated by the jocks and others at our school, where he was picked on ruthlessly for being short and skinny and quiet. Thankfully, his moms not only appreciated his artistic abilities, but encouraged them. Two years ago, they'd remodeled their garage into a weatherproofed, sound-insulated, air-conditioned art studio for their son, which had become our de facto hangout space. I left my bag by the sofa and tiptoed over to the easel. Do I get to see this one? Do you ever? He replied without looking at me. I frowned. Three years of friendship, and other than some doodles and sketches, he'd never let me see any of his work. I knew he was protective of it, but if he couldn't show his art to Gabe and me, how was he ever going to share it with the world? No, I said simply, you don't. But maybe you should start. First day of senior year. Perfect time for... He held up his free hand, demanding silence, while he added a few finishing strokes to the canvas. I clenched my jaw. Nothing pissed me off more than being interrupted, which Spencer knew damn well. Finally, he whisked a tarp off the floor and flung it over the easel. Now you can talk. That's a horrible way to greet a friend you haven't seen in two months. Spencer dropped his brush into a jug of murky water, then wiped his hands on a rag of questionable cleanliness. I missed you too. I rolled my eyes as he stood, smiling down at me. He was taller than he'd been last time I saw him, and his body was broader, less boyish, a mix of angles and sharp lines. Spencer and his moms had spent most of the summer on an art tour of Western Europe, and it was almost as if an entirely different person had returned in his place. You look weird, I blurted. Not offended in the least, Spencer laughed. Now who's being horrible? I mean, different, not weird. I could feel the heat mounting in my cheeks. Why was I embarrassed? I didn't want him to see me blush, so I threw my arms around his waist instead. I did miss you. Spencer stiffened. Yeah? He said softly. Well, duh. I'd miss both my friends. While Spencer had been in Europe, Gabe had spent most of his free time at the comic book store. I was the only one stuck at home with nothing to do. Except hang out with Jesse. A nervous fluttering spread upward from my stomach. I told Jesse to meet me at Spencer's, which meant he'd be here any minute. How was I going to explain him to my friends? I felt Spencer's arms tying around me and caught the unmistakable scent of cologne, something rich and spicy and, in my limited imagination on the subject, utterly European. I took a deep breath, attempting to place the fruit and floral notes, and the fluttering in my stomach stopped replaced by a sharp pain as if my intestines were being twisted in a vice. Nerves. But why should I be nervous with Spencer? It was, it was utterly illogical. Perhaps I was having an allergic reaction to the cologne. A synaptic response to an action potential. Before I could further examine my current physical and emotional state, the side door flew open and Gabe barged in. The bus broke down, he cried. I got stuck exiting behind a hipster with a penny-farthing bicycle that barely fit down the stairs, and then there was a nun in line ahead of me at the bagel shop who I swear to God, he made the sign of the cross, was buying bagels for the entire convent, which seems strange to me, but whatever. And then I had to walk ten blocks in this heat, he paused, panting heavily. So it's not my fault. I would have been on time, I swear. Gabe always knew how to make an entrance. Spencer broke away from me. That's okay. He was late, too. I shoved him. Was not. I don't believe it, Gabe said with an arched brow as he dropped a brown paper bag on the coffee table. He certainly hadn't dressed up for the first day of school. Baggy cargo shorts and a t-shirt sporting a geek-tastic HTML code saying sarcasm. A well-worn flannel shirt on top. I was exactly... 45 seconds early, I said, and shot Spencer a withering look. He met my gaze coolly. 15.
which is exactly 4 minutes and 45 seconds late, according to Beatrice Standard Time, Gabe added. I know, but I'm at the mercy of my mother, who spent an hour in the bathroom getting turded up for work. I opened the bag and began removing a spread of pre-cut bagels and cream cheese, laying them out on the napkins in a neat orderly row. Plain bagels in the middle, with the fruity ones on the left, and the savory varieties on the right, so they wouldn't contaminate each other. Gabe grabbed half a blueberry bagel and slathered it with whipped cream cheese. You didn't tell me your mom was on the prowl again. I shrugged. You weren't around. I was here all summer. Yeah, I said, but you spent almost all of it gaming down at the hidey hole. He narrowed his eyes. Actually, I was researching a new article for the school paper on the cultural impact of miniature tabletop warfare games on the generation of future politicians and military strategists. That sounds significantly less incendiary than your last article, Spencer said. Gabe winced. Tell me about it. His expose on the dangerous workout Coach Summers was forcing on the football team last year had gotten the coach fired and hadn't exactly endeared Gabe to the jocktocracy in the process. Not that they'd exactly loved him before. His penchant for smart-ass one-liners and class clownery had earned him plenty of ass-kickings, even before he'd turned his caustic journalist pen on Fullerton Hill's protected class. But as much as Gabe would love to claim that all his hours at the hidey hole were spent pursuing a new lead, I knew better. My phone buzzed in my pocket. Balancing my bagel in one hand, I fished it out. What's Spencer's address? I think I'm lost. Is that your mom? Gabe asked. No. I typed a quick response to Jesse so I didn't have to look them in the eyes. Maybe it's Castle and Cairns, Gabe said. And B's her new bestie. Spencer snorted. Zero percent chance of that. More like five percent. The idea that the most popular girl in school would befriend me, queen of the outcasts, was ludicrous, but not technically out of the realm of possibility. Spencer smiled wickedly. Then maybe it's a hot new boyfriend. Thad Everett, Gabe suggested, naming one of the most loathsome members of the football team. Spencer laughed. No way, dude. Milo Morris. The way he calls her math girl is so romantic. I really didn't care that most of the Fullerton Hills student body knew me only as the math girl. Our school was filled with jerks and terrible people, and their dismissive nickname for me just made it easier to ignore them all. Hold up. Gabe dropped his bagel onto a napkin. Other than Spence and me, you don't talk to other people at school. Ever. So if that's not your mom, who's texting you? Um, I was working up the courage to explain when there was a soft knock at the door, and we all turned to the window where Jesse stood with a dorky little smile on his lips. Gabe turned to me, his eyes wide. Is that Jesse Sullivan? However, B soon realizes that her new identity as Trixie isn't all it was cracked up to be. Now B finds herself with surprising consequences and must find a way to take back her original identity and fix everything before it's too late in I'm Not Your Manic Pixie Dream Girl by Gretchen McNeil. This is truly a novel you can simply sink your teeth into. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, check out my hashtag MSMReadyToRead and follow me on Instagram at ms underscore martins underscore class for more new books and fun lessons that are sure to engage you and your kiddos. Be sure to tune in next week for my next Book Talk Tuesday podcast. And please comment below if you've read this book or another book by the author. Thanks for watching.